box of some yeah. dried throat that I've been afflicted with lately. First, thank you to Peter for inviting me as well. It's good to be back. The day will come when fire carriages on iron wheels will bring death. I'm sure you've all heard this. The famous prophecy of Brian Rua in the 1700s. It was laterally interpreted as a prediction that the first and last trains on the railway would carry the dead. We'll hear more of that. The first railway in Ireland was in 1834. Um, that was Dublin to Kingstown, Dublin to Dunleary, which was also the world's first commuter railway, but that's another story. By the time the railway reached Westport in the 1860s, there were already proposals being made to extend it further. The main bulk of railway building in Ireland was between the uh, 1840s and the 18, late 60s, 70s. By this stage, the railways at this stage, they were all commercial companies. Their first loyalty was not the travelling public, it was their shareholders, their investors, who wanted to return the money. So by the time the 1870s, early 80s came, most of the towns in Ireland, most of the places where businessmen believed they could make money out of operating a railway were already connected. Remoter areas weren't. However, as our last speaker mentioned, the, uh, where, where are you, Joe? Oh, there you are. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Chuk's involvement with the Light Railways Act and promoting railway building, very much so. In uh, 1883 and 89, you had the, the, the Valfar Acts, which were passed, which gave government, British government assistance to building railways in areas that would not be otherwise commercially viable. The Appen Line was one such. Most of them were up and down the west of Ireland, from Kerry right up to northwest Donegal. This was one of them. So the first uh, talk of a railway in this area was a railway to Mulrally, and there were there were early talk about it, or early proposals for being a narrow gauge railway. The neighbouring Midland Great Western Railway, the big railway company that would operate it, they refused point blank uh, to countenance anything like this. They wanted something that their old standard trains could run on. They wanted something built to mainline standards. They took the view, if we're going to be asked to operate this, we, uh, we don't want any second rate work or any non-standard equipment. So that was ruled out. And the line, the construction of it commenced then in 1890. This, there was a proposal for the West Mayo Light Railway at the same time. There was another proposal for a railway going on beyond Mulrani, up through Ballycroy, up to Belmont. Now, remote as that is now, there's hardly anybody lived up there at that time. It was very, it's, why build a railway to Belmont? Because the British government, at the time was considering various places in the west of Ireland for a major transatlantic port. Carriage of mails in the pre-internet days, the very important communication between the growing America and the British Empire with the mail, that was number one. Now this was never built, but that's the only reason there was any talk of any railway to Ben Mullis at that stage. In 1890, agreements were reached, the construction started. Lord Balfour visited as well. And there is a story told that he, there, there had been some proposals at this stage for extending the railway from Mulrani to Ackle. No decisions have been taken. But there is a story told that Balfour was given a better reception in Ackle than he was in Ben Mullet. So he decided that the railway would go to Ackle. Whatever, whether, whether there's truth in that, nobody knows. But they did decide, having now decided to build the railway to Mulrani, they now decided to extend it on uh, to Ackle. They planned the stations to be here at Mulrani and also at Doon Trusk and at Tom Reddy. Now the latter two were never built. By 1892, as far as Newport is concerned, the work was in full swing and the engineers appointed, um, a William Barrington of Limbeck, uh, was concerned about the work on the building of the viaduct outside the door here. When the workmen went to finish their shifts at night, the local children were playing on the half-built pillars 
and they were worried somebody would fall and become injured and they wanted watchmen and the engineer of the railway company argued over who should pay for the watchmen which actually is a, a, a minor detail in an ongoing issue throughout the whole time the railway was being built the Midland and Great Western Railway Company's own engineer, William Barrington, and the various subcontractors, there was a constant litany of arguments about money and of half-finished contracts. Any builders here? <laughs> half-finished contracts, and you didn't pay me for that, and um, you're asking too much money for that. This, there was a whole, I, I could do an entire talk on that issue alone, believe you me. However, things moved on, and by the first, by the 2nd of January, 1894, 16 new locomotives had been ordered for the Ackill Line, for Ballinat, Illala, for Dublin, uh, Tonsilla, Navan, Kingscourt, the Athboy Line, and several other branch lines in the Midland Great Western Railway Territory. These would end up pulling the first trains to Ackill. 2nd of January 1894, the railway was inspected as far as Newport. And shortly after, on the 1st of February 1894, there was an anniversary coming up in two years' time, the January after next, um, the first train got as far as Newport. Now, these are the railways in the area. The railway into Westport, which opened in the 1860s, the railway up to Ballina, these are the dotted lines of some of the other ones that were planned in the area. They're all over the place. There was to be a line from Ballina to Belmollet. There was another line to go up via Ballycastle to Belmollet. These are all separate proposals. The one that concerns us here would have been from Monorani, either round the coast, up to Ballycroy in that way, or else halfway out to Ackill. There was going to be a huge big viaduct right across the bay. It would have been a massive engineering work. You can see there where it is. Even at Ackham itself, there was to be a little branch line out to Gubbard Letter for the benefit of fishermen, and another one to Inishlyre for the same purpose. None of them were ever built. The Westport Key Line was. Another proposal for Lewisburg never happened either. But this, this shows the way in those days, even after the main commercial railways had been built, even after we're in a situation where we're looking at government assistance to go into remote areas, all these proposals are still floating about. And this is what was eventually built. So the 1st of February 1894, the first trains <coughs> rolled into Newport. And there were the two tunnels just outside the town, which were the main engineering features on the line apart from the viaduct. Can you imagine? rolling through the rolling hills coming in from Westport and you're sitting in your compartment with your horsehair cushions and varnished open walnut panelling in the railway carriage and uh, you go into a tunnel and you come out and then you're into another tunnel and you come out and then over this magnificent viaduct. What an introduction to the town. What an introduction. By, by May of this year, 1894, the railway was now complete to Monorani, which was to be the terminus initially. They had to finish the fencing off, so uh, well, the track was complete, the bridges were complete, and an inspection took place. And apart from a few minor tweaks, the railway was ready to be opened. So February 94, the first train to Newport. On the 16th of July, 1894, it opened to Monorani in the midst of yet another Round, round of courtroom battles and um, sarcastic correspondence, which is still in the Irish Rail archives in Dublin, between um, Barrington, Worthington, and the Midland Great Western Railway, all the engineers involved. By now, the post office was in discussion with the railway about carrying the mails. This was the important thing, as I said earlier, in the pre internet day. Um, and a contract was signed to carry the mails to Ackle, more of which later. By 1890, to go back a bit, they decided to build on to Ackle. This is now under construction. The contractors had temporarily tracked down as far as Tonry B. 
beyond here. They're just preparing the, front, the, the formation of the railway. And they're the station at Acken Half built. They're the main building, which in recent years was a youth hostel. I think it's empty now. You know, opposite Alice's. Um, they've got the actual building built, but the platforms aren't. There's a photograph showing a pile of planks and blocks and builder stuff outside it. And then, in May, uh, the exact date, yeah, 14th of June 1894, was the drowning tragedy in Clew Bay. We heard about the emigration, the seasonal emigration. Well, they used to come in from Ackle in little boats. They'd come in to Westport and transfer into the bigger boats to go to Scotland. And as the youngsters, mostly teenagers in early 20s, as they came into Westport Harbour, they saw a coal ship, a steamship. That's the first time they'd ever seen a steamship. And all the young ones, they all crowded over to the side of the boat and it tipped and in they went. Now, there were hundreds of them. Luckily, the majority of them were saved, but unfortunately, 32 of them, some as young as 12, were drowned. The authorities asked the railway company could the bodies be taken back to Ackill? The railway company replied that the, the railway was operational for the last couple of months and insured as far as Newport. They could make arrangements to get to Mulrany, but the track wasn't quite ready the whole way into Ackill. However, they were in the process of doing it. So uh, an agreement was made that the train could come along as long as it was hauled by a small locomotive the contractor's locomotive, more of which later, which went slowly along the temporary track and they got the track into Ackill. So the first train into Ackill in fulfilment of the prophecy, in a sense, although the prophecy never mentioned the railway. <laughs> it said fire carriages and iron wheels will bring death, but never let the truth get in the way of a good story. The first train into Ackill did indeed carry the dead, unfortunately. And that uh, the, the, the railway was opened to the public <coughs> later on the 13th of May, 1895. The line was hilly. <coughs> this point, just outside Mulrany, was the highest point. This is a railway gradient profile, which gives the gradient 1 in 75, 1 in 70 <coughs> level. How many level bits can you see on the whole railway? There's, what, a third of a mile. There's about the length of this room. There's something similar. Hardly any of it was level. And there were quite severe gradients here to such an extent that there were special instructions issued for shunting wagons in Mulrani Station. They had to have the hand brakes half on. So that if a wagon ran away, you know, the wheels would be grinding against the... It wouldn't run freely. Because there had been a runaway. They were, uh, they were you know, the, the good shed Mulrani, it was, it was a parish hall in recent years. There was a wagon in the siding outside that, and the locomotive went to move it, and the wagon went off down the hill towards Newport, uh, derailing several miles down the line at the bottom of the slope. Any of you who've done the cycle on the Greenway, when you're approaching Mulrani from either direction, you'll be well aware of that gradient. Rails look flat, but if you're ever in the cab of a train going along, you can see the rails going up and down, but not as flat as they look. They're flatter than roads. This is an early photograph taken in Ackley Station. This ground is uh, unfinished. If you think of where this is and what's over here, the good shed is there now. The good shed hasn't been finished in this picture. And this is a typical approach of the early type that travelled on the line. This was the carriage at the end of the train. The raised bit here, and the inside there were like little steps. The train guard could get up and he could look along the roofs of the train to make sure that nothing had got uncoupled. This was called a bird cage, a bird cage carriage. I'll show you more of that later. By now, by the first summer, uh, there was an excursion train from Castlereagh around to County Ross Common, direct out to Ackham, and the railway company realised the potential for tourism. 
They planned to build a hotel. They bought land off of Easy Stoneys adjacent to the railway station in um, Mulrani, where the, that family had a, a little fishing lodge. It's still standing beside the hotel. It's called Enel Lodge. It's derelict now. They bought that and later used it for staff accommodation of the hotel. The hotel uh, was opened in uh, was opened in 1897, and they appointed uh, a manageress, and the hotel began to get very popular indeed. As you know, it's my niece is getting married there next year, um, and so on. It's a very popular place still. So as the railway was opened, these are the sort of gatehouses they had. Three rooms, tiny little bedrooms, outside toilet. This is the drawing of one of them, signed by William Barrington, 20th of January, 1891. This was a standard type of gatehouse. You can still see them in some cases heavily uh, <coughs> enlarged and modernized along the route of the railway today. It was a standard design of passage used on a lot of branch lines all over Ireland, all over the middle part of Ireland. There's one of them. In, uh, I took that picture about 25 years ago. Uh, it's in pretty uh, original condition there. This well-known picture from the Lawrence collection shows the tunnel. Uh, the photographer has his back to the viaduct, obviously. You're looking into the first one. You can see here, it's only just been finished. And these were some of the workers. And they were later told by the uh, inspector of the line to get rid of these piles of rocks that were here and there along the line. There's an interesting thing here. This is the old road to Newport, uh, Westport, Newport. That is where that petrol station now is. Some of you may remember, <coughs> going back to the 1970s, you could still make out the route of a railway line round here. But this was the route of the railway line. And the first time I explored this, I walked along there with my dad. It would have been in the late 1960s. And you could still see um, parallel consecutive ridges in the ground where railway sleepers had been. It transpires that this was the original route and they got to here and decided that the, the, the gradient, this was at a higher level than this, that the gradient was going to be too steep down to the viaduct and the curve too sharp. They had built it like this to avoid the expense of the tunnel which was the subject of another series of rows between <laughs> the railway company and the engineers. So they eventually built this with not one but two tunnels. But that's how there came to be two tunnels on this line. So between Y and X, there's difference in height of about that much, which wouldn't be much for a road, but for a railway, that's, uh, that's, quite a, that's quite a gradient. So this section was constructed as far as here, and then it stopped. And they decided, Anno, look, rewind, start again. And they did this instead. The so-called deviation. Many, many years ago, when I was researching for the book on the Ackham Railway in the corner there, I spoke to uh, the late Michael Sheridan at the bottom of the street. And it was the morning of the book lunch in the Castle Court Hotel in Westport. And uh, I was traveling out with the publisher to introduce him to shopkeepers around the place. Do you want to stock some of these books, etc.? So we're in his van, and he's got crates full of books in the back of it. And um, we're driving back from Ackle Island. And uh, the publisher, he says to me, um, he says, you know, you know what will probably happen at the book launch? I says, what? He says, you'll get somebody who'll come up with some photograph or some gem of information that nobody's ever heard of. And it would have made such a difference. He says, believe you me, he says, and his publishing firm had been in the go since the mid-1930s. He says, believe you me, with historical books, this happens all the time. And the author is going, why didn't I? <laughs> so we had a laugh about that. Went into Sheridan's. And uh, I, I wanted to give Michael a copy of it. He said, uh, I take it to the story of the ghost. <laughs> and I said, 
Hot Ghost. And the publisher sort of looks at me and he started laughing. He said, what did I tell you? I said, so tell me about the ghost. And apparently there was a story, according to, according to Michael, that uh, when you left Newport, came across the viaduct, and went into this first tunnel, if you're heading for Westport, um, the, 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 some of the older carriages have no lights in them, so it's pitch dark for a few seconds. And when you come out in this little short space, which is barely twice the length of from me to that corner, if that, there's a man sitting opposite you, all dressed in black, in Victorian <laughs> clothes. And you go into, and he's staring at you, but a blank look. And you go into the second tunnel, and you come out, and he's gone. Mm. And I said, no, I never, where, where did you get that one from? Oh, he says, that's well known. It used to be back in the day. Well, it's not in the book, but there you have it. Um, this little bridge here is still in existence. It's, it's off limits as far as public access is concerned, but that's it. So that was built. The other tunnel's over here. The line around the hill is here, so no train ever ran over that, but it's still there. And of course we all know about this. There's the tunnel we were looking at a minute ago. The overgrowth is still not grown, so uh, this is taken shortly after the line opened. The William Lawrence and Welsh, uh, as we all know, uh, took a lot of photographs in this area. They covered this area very well. If you look at railway clues of where they take pictures with railway subjects in them, and they took quite a lot. They took a lot of public infrastructure, not just railways, churches, roads, bridges, monuments. And if you look at the clues, such as the design of a signal or something or other, or the lack of vegetation, or um, a particular type of locomotive in a picture, you will see it's possible to gain clues that they probably were here in 1895, 1900, and 1905, that's one of the earlier pictures. That type of signal was replaced. You can see just there, the signal post is thicker than lower down. That's because there was a slot in the middle of it. And when the signal arm was lowered, instead of a more modern, conventional signal that goes like that, stop, go, this one dropped into the slot inside the post. They didn't last long. So that's how we know those two clues, that that's an early photograph. That's somewhat later. I, I was a lot later. I took that one. <laughs> <coughs> we all know what that is. This is a plan of Newport Station. This is the viaduct. This has come out of the tunnel. When you came in, the, the, the railway was single track, so there's a passing loop. So train coming in from Ackle, he comes in here. He crosses over and he sits in that platform. You can see the little arrow pointing this way. In railway terminology, he's crossing the train in the other direction. You can't have two trains meet in a single track. They have to pass. It's like a lay-by. The other train comes in here, stops at the signal. Now he can continue. The bridge that's taken away on the, on the road, around the, around the corner here, the way out to Morelli, went under a double track. If you look at the one remaining abutment, it's the width of two railway tracks, because not only did the running line go over it, but this siding, these were cattle sidings where the, the car dealership and petrol station are now. On fair days, and Newport was the busiest station on the railway, and the busiest day in Newport was fair day, and these were for the cattle trains. Other than that, the normal freight was what's now the oratory. That's the oratory. Now this is a diagrammatic map. In reality, the track came in behind the main platform and ran parallel. And the oratory, it's, it's not at that angle to the main station building, it's sort of that shape, you know. But this was a diagra diagrammatic map uh, done and owned by the railway company. The point being to mark the position of the various signals along the line that use these things in the engines. So that's the layout of the station. So a normal train would come through from Westport. He's got a couple of trucks on the back. He stops at the platform. People get in and out. Then he pulls forward and he reverses in here and unhooks a truck of stuff that's come from Westport or Dublin. And then on he goes. So people had to get used to lengthy station stops. 
Coming the other direction, it was more convoluted, and we see pictures this later on. The train comes in from Ackham and parks here. Now, supposing there's a wagon of goods being consigned from Ackham to Newport, the locomotive, there's a carriage sitting there, and the wagon's behind it, mixed trains, passenger and freight. The engine has to unhook, it goes down here, it travels along here, it drives in against the back of the train, unhooks the truck, takes it out, shoves it in there, out here, <laughs> back up here, back onto the front of the train, and away it goes. So if you look at the timetables on the, on the line, you will find that uh, one of the trains was a passenger train, one was a mixed train. The mixed train took about an hour and a half to get from Ackham, an hour and 40 minutes, because he had to stop in Mulrani and he had to stop in Newport to hook and unhook wagons. This is from the early days of the railway again. He's come out of the tunnel here. You can see the embankment is very, nothing much has grown on it yet. And the viaduct goes across here into the station. And you can see on the original picture the way it goes on out there. Now the layout of the road, when you got, there's the Hotel Newport, um, Hotel Newport there. When you go round like this, the road used to go further down and round like that. You can make it, if you look up the old uh, maps in Geohive, you can see where the road used to go. And they had to alter the uh, route of the road when the railway was built. And when the railway was closed, they altered it again to its current formation. In 1911, the post office told the railway they were unhappy with the time it took to get mails to Ackle. Due to the sparse service in the line, only three trains a day, uh, the mail from Dublin didn't get into Ackle until the quarters of three in the afternoon. So the railway company manufactured, they ordered from a firm in Birmingham a contraption, a small little uh, kerosene powered four wheel rail car, a very, very early internal combustion passenger carrying vehicle, one of the first in the world. It was highly unreliable. It would only carry six passengers. You'll see a picture of it later on. More about that later on. Mulrani still has this water tank. Why? Well, to give locomotives water, yes, but it's on the Westport bound platform. On the platform where the station building was, there was a water crane, a column, a water column, to give a locomotive a drink after coming up that long climb, having come all the way from Westport. But a train coming from Ackham, only seven odd miles away, has had its tanks full to the brim. Why would it need a drink here? Well, it didn't, and don't, it, it never did. <laughs> the reason that water tower was built in Mulrani at all is because Mulrani was originally to be the terminus. They already had it ordered, the tank house, and it's still there. This was hardly ever used in railway days. They'd water the engine on the way down. When it got to Ackham, they'd rake out the clinkers, they'd remake the fire, they'd fill it with coal, and they'd fill it with water. It wouldn't need to be refilled when it got to here. There's one early station in its early days. One unusual feature about that, it didn't have a footbridge. It had a barrel crossing. If you built a new railway today, a mainline railway, and you just put a <laughs> footpath at the bottom of it, just watch the health and safety police come out of the woodwork. You can get away with that. This uh, little building, this platform shelter, was standing until the 1970s, gradually falling to bits now. So this train has come in from uh, the Ackle direction. It's got its birdcage roofed fan on the end. It's got two or three freight wagons. Uh, and the little locomotive in the front. There doesn't appear to be a passenger coach on that. There's only three wagons, so that's an extra train. It's probably on a fair day. They didn't have separate freight trains generally in that line uh, until the last days because there wasn't enough business. But do you remember I mentioned the, the water column on the down platform? Well, that was here. It hasn't been built yet. It hasn't been built yet. <laughs> and here you can see piles of red brick the station's only just finished. This is all newly cut, nothing's grown over that yet. So again, this is just after the line opened. Ackham Railway Station was built with uh, delusions of grandeur. 
It says, round the back of there, you can't see here, but that siding went on around here along the coast side. This is where the road is. That's where Alice, that's where the Garda station is. That's where Alice's is. That's where the bridge over onto the island is. And this is the station building here. The station building, locomotive shed here, carriage shed here. They have two separate lines for storing passenger coaches on a line that throughout its life rarely needed more than one or two carriages. There are one, two, three good sidings. Newport made do with one, and Newport was the busiest station. They have a shunting loop for the goods yard alone, and a pretty sizable goods shed. This is a place worthy of a very, very large town. But the whole idea behind building this, remember the Balfour Acts, was to open up the area. The British government believed that if they built these lines, it would improve the economy. But as Jerry said, more often than not, it just helped people immigrate. More of which later too. There was Mulrani. So the train comes in from Ackham. Well, if it's heading that way, you go into this platform. There's where the water tower is. Coming from Newport, it comes in here. And the trains can cross. A couple of sidings there. The signal cabin is long gone. The good shed is still there. I think it's a par it's parachol, isn't it? Something like that. And that's the old railway building, and of course this is now the Greenway. There's a bungalow right across the line here now. So the Greenway, you have to go down and round the village and back up onto it again. This is just after it was opened. These houses were um, occupied by the, the navvies, the fellows that built the line. And the parish pri priest complained to the railway, that's the old Church of Ireland, the parish priest uh, of the area complained to the railway company uh, while the railway was being built of scenes of drunkenness and debauchery and hutching making round here. And, uh, but the sheds remained for many years after. Looking down at the station, this is the road. That's Sweeney's across the bridge. That's where Alice's is now, the garden station will be about there. Um, the railway station building, you can see the chimney and the roof of it there. The locomotive shed is still there, but it's been extended upwards. This old corrugated iron carriage shed and the signal cabin are long gone. The good shed is still there. This is a row of trucks owned by the builder shortly after the line opened. They were still there in 1905 when the railway company yet again complained to the builder, get your stuff, you know why builders leave stuff behind? Well, there's a whole row of railway wagons and they were blocking, the railway couldn't use that good siding because they were in the way. So that's a, an interesting view of the area. It's now overgrown. You couldn't take that picture now. That's the same time again. That's up against the buffer stops. That's Sweeney's. That's the old part of Sweeney's. The, the new part would be in the way of that view now. Of course, that's Ackill Island. Another view. Now, this is the early engines that have been ordered from a firm in England called Kitson and another firm in England called Sharp Stewart and Company for all these uh, lines that were built uh, of around this time. Builders rubbish, <coughs> builders wagons, this one's still full of planks. This is around 1895-96, that locomotive was number 115 and although this is not the day the railway opened, it's very soon after and that actually is there were 16 of those engines, but that actually is the same one that pulled the first train into Ackham. The train has come in. He's unhooked up there. He's come back along the loop here. He's reversed up to the back of the train. He's lifted the bird cage down off it. He's shoved that up here or out of the way. He will then take these trucks. He'll take them down here, and he'll push them up there. If these ones are already sitting there, are empty, having been unloaded, he'd hook them all up, he'd haul the same lot out again, he'd put the empties in here, then he'd come back up and put the full ones back there. Now you see the very last vehicle with the higher roof, that's the passenger coach. So then what he'd do, he has to make the train up again. So then he comes down here, he lifts the carriage, comes up here, reverses in against the bird cage. now he's got the carriage and the van behind him, then he comes in and he hooks up to those, uh, or the empties that are here, out again, back into the platform, <laughs> waiting for the people to get onto the 1140. 
the shunting procedures um, convoluted. Between 1914 and 1921, the railways came under government, British government control as a result of the First World War. Nothing much happened in Ackham. This was largely to facilitate movement of military supplies in Britain. Nothing much different happened here. This is a typical train from the early days. One of these little engines, the original ones, a third class carriage, a first class carriage, another third, so it must be market day, and the van. Now there are no goods wagons on this one this day, there's some park down there. Remember there was one passenger train and one or two mixed trains a day. So that's the passenger train. That will only take an hour and 20 minutes. Because it doesn't, it'll just stop in the station and go on. Station stops tended to be about five minutes in a passenger train because there was no through corridor and no toilets. So if you'd been in Sweeney's bar across the road, <laughs> beginning to stand in poses, you'll want to hop off at Mulrani and go into the Jackson, on you go. Again, just after the line opened, this train is heading for Ackham. It's the passenger train again. That, in the middle, is a brand new first class coach. Uh, the ones either side will be uh, the thirds. It's one of those small engines. Again, nothing has grown here yet. And the guards have the brake fan at the end. This is a very early picture, around 1900 or thereabouts, maybe a couple of years before. Essential supplies. <laughs> this was actually, um, if it had been 50 years earlier, you'd say it was famine relief. It was relief supplies of grain that were coming into Africa. That's what this was. Uh, the reason this is Guinness on it is quite simply because uh, a lot of beer was carried, Guinness was travelled, carried all around the country by train, and most railway companies had a certain amount of goods fans reserved for Guinness traffic, but they borrow them for other things now and again. This is a, just a standard freight fan in Ireland. This is a different one. This is a peculiarly Irish invention. Officially the convertible van, known to railway men as the soft top. It's got a canvas roof in the middle. That's just the same double doors this has. But why is the roof hard, open, and then hard? Because for economy, Irish railway companies, uh, their biggest freight traffic, especially in the west of Ireland, biggest by far was live cattle. Live cattle. So they did have big fleets of cattle trucks with this part here and this part here, either side of the door open to give the animals ventilation. However, they used these as well. This was um, an economy measure, uh, peculiarly uh, an Irish solution to an Irish problem, if you like. <coughs> when they were carrying cattle, they took the canvas top off to give cattle ventilation. When they were finished carrying cattle, they swept them out, they washed them out, with buckets of water, there were people employed just to do that on cattle fair days. And then you will often see pictures of old cattle trucks with whitish stuff around the bottom of them, lime wash to purify them. There's no jays fluid in those days. And then they'd be back carrying butter and eggs and parcels and newspapers and whatever. Now, I mentioned earlier the fact that when the coffin train came into Ackham, uh, just before the line opened. The last stretch from Mulrani to Aachen was only temporary track. It wouldn't have taken the weight of a full-size locomotive, so they used the contractor's locomotive, which had a name plate on the side which said Newmarket. The contractor Worthington had built a lot of railways from the 1880s through to 1913, when he sold off all his equipment, including that engine. He had started off, he had purchased this locomotive to haul construction trains on the line from Antir to Newmarket in West Cork, in, in North County Cork, on the, on the Kerry line. And uh, when that line was finished, the engine was transferred to several other construction projects he was doing. It ended up in Ackham, and it, hauled, it was one of two locomotives which hauled the construction trains on the Ackham line. It appeared, now it was rebuilt, through its life, and we don't know what the original form looked like, but it appears to be the bigger of the two, 
and therefore it's almost certain that that is the locomotive that was that pulled that train. After the Acre line was opened, it was used on the Clare Morris to Caluni line. It ended up being used on what appears to be the last major railway he did from Armagh to Castlebane in County Monaghan. Uh, it was then bought by the Great Northern Railway, and they used it until the early 1930s on the Valley Hayes to Belturb branch line, and then being non standard, it was scrapped. This is the standard type of locomotive that was used on the Acre line. This one's called Bat. They peculiar their names like Bat and Elf and Wasp. Really odd names for steam engines. So the water's carried there, that's fine. That's all the size of the coal bunker. Now, on Hemsworth <coughs> railway lines, I've driven and fired steam locomotives. And I would not be confident about leaving Ackle with only that much coal, with a market day special, with a dozen heavy cattle trucks and three carriages full of cattle drovers behind me. I wouldn't like to try to get to Westport with one of those things. Perhaps hardly surprisingly, after five years, they were all moved elsewhere. They were never seen the Acre line again. They were too small. They too small. They wouldn't have been strong enough for the Mulrani, Mulrani gradients on fair days. They were moved away. Three of them even went to the Waterford and Tremor Railway. They worked in West Cork, far away from here. And they got a new type of engine instead, the famous Ackle bogies, this one called Jupiter. Now imagine the colour scheme. It's a rich, dark, emerald green. The frames are painted brown. The lining is in yellow, black, white, and gold. Polished brass number, polished brass makers paint. The carriages are a dark, varnished colour, sort of like, well, this. That's the carriage, that's the colour the carriages were. There's another of them, Wolf Dog, number 37. The coat of arms of the Midland Great Western Railway Company. This is taken in Broadstone Works in Dublin and the driver and the fireman. They wore ties in those days. There's a drawing of one, which is in the book. This is number 530 in Westport. There were five of them all together. And this particular one pulled the last train the day after the railway closed. Seven or eight wagons had been brought in on the very last train into Ackle, probably with supplies for Sweeney's. So they would have been unloaded on the last operational day of the railway. On the day after the railway closed, in other words, the first day of the road freight and bus services, this fellow leaves, where he's on the turntable in Westport here. It left Westport and it headed out on its own to Ackle to pick up the empty trucks and bring them back. But not without incident, because on the very last day, the railway had been let run down by this stage, and some of the fences were getting broken down, and he ran over a sheep near Mulrani <laughs> when he was heading out. There he is on the turntable, same little moment. But this is, there were five of these that monopolized the train services on the Acker line from 1905 on. There's no fancy lining of this, the main place is gone. When the Midland Great Western Railway became part of the Great Southern Railways in 1925, all the very colourful and ornate liveries of the old railway companies were swept away and all locomotives were painted a funereal, all over, unlined grey, a dark grey colour, and all the name plates were removed and melted down the economy. By 1933, a large drop in traffic was evident on the railway. The roads were still not tarmacked, but road vehicles were improving, the county council was putting heavier stone down on the roads, and trucks were beginning to appear. And the railway, and of course, a lot of people were emigrating, so the railway traffic was declining considerably. The Great Southern Railways did a survey of uh, the railway, a lot of 14 different railway lines from as far afield as Kinsale in Killala. And this was to establish, was it worth keeping them at all? In the 1930s, Ireland, remember, is not a wealthy country. There's no Google headquarters in Dublin in those days. And um, the Great Southern Railway just didn't have the money. Nobody had the money. So there, there were arrears of maintenance. 
They reckoned that in order, there was a 25 mile an hour speed limit over the whole line at this stage, and several others, because the track was getting so worn out. And the, the track, the civil engineer in charge of the track reported that if this line is to be maintained much longer, the entire line needs to be re relayed from scratch, and that's £40,000. That was huge money back then. So the writing is now on the wall. The Great Southern established the Great Southern established that um, only two trains a day, the 11.40 out of Ackham and the half eight out of Westport towards Ackham, they were the only ones with any sort of load on them. The afternoon passenger train was recorded as having passenger figures over a period of, uh, they took two weeks out of each month during the summer. And sometimes the passenger figures on the afternoon passenger train, two people, five people, so people were beginning to travel by road. Train services were initially three a day. By the 1930s, the third one only ran on Thursday, the market day. In 1934, it was announced that, in June 1934, they announced that at the end of the year, the railway would close, on the 31st of December 1934. But there was such an, out an outcry from local traders, mainly led by the Lavelles and Sweeney's from Ackle, and also by a firm here, whose name escapes me, they were importing cement into, in bags into Newport, Mac, Mac Ellen, Mac Ellen's, yes. They picked up an almighty fuss and had a deputation of traders go to Dublin, but so did Mayo County Council, because they were afraid that replacement bus services would wreck the road. So the railway agreed to postpone uh, the closure, but they would withdraw the passenger service. So for just over a year the railway ran, throughout 1935, one freight train a day, no passengers, and they put on a bus for the passengers. And sure enough, Mayo County Council complained that the bus was wrecking the roads, and they demanded that the Great Southern Railways restore the passenger service. So they did. They restored the passenger service in uh, April 1936, and the service would remain until closure. One passenger train and one mixed train a day. This is in Westport. Now remember this, because this will come in, that picture, the one that's in, isn't it? This will come in later on. Look at the cab. It's got a cab roof which flares up. Now that's all fine and dandy if you're traveling in this direction, the sort of rain you saw this morning. Can you imagine if the locomotive was traveling tender first? That would funnel the weather in on top of the driver. Having been in a steam engine going forwards when it's raining, you get scorched here and frozen and soaked there. Mm. They weren't built for comfort, these things. That train is in Westport Station, and it's about to leave to go to Dublin. It's a long journey, one of those things. But these locomotives were used at times on the Ackle Line too, not regularly. But you'll see one of these later on with the flare cab. By the 1920s, they were rebuilding them with conventional cabs, which had a flat roof and came out to here. But that's just a little detail. Uh, this is a locomotive from the Great Southern and Western Railway. When the, um, when the railways were amalgamated, you get what, they, what the railway then called foreign engines, railways whose origin, engines whose origins were different railway companies. And that engine was built for operation in Kerry. It was ended up. There is the rail car. The post office had the railway company build. It carried six passengers. It's a kerosene engine, which after two years failed. They put a petrol engine in it. After another two years, that was so highly unreliable, they gave it up. It was towed to Dublin. It was stuck in the back of Inchicore Works. And 15 years later, in 1930, it was photographed there, derelict, with the uh, engine compartment taken off it. Look at the old brass lamps on it, like an old-fashioned car. It was built by a company called, uh, in, in Broadheath, Manchester, Charles Robertson Company. It was a one-off. And because this thing was introduced in the mid-1910s, never mind it was retired before 1918, that is one of the earliest examples 
in the world of an internal combustion powered passenger carrying vehicle, every modern diesel train, including all the ones we have today, worldwide, that is one of their, their earliest ancestors. And the very, very first, as an aside, was Irish too. The very first, it ran in County Donegal, as preserved in the museum in Belfast, by the way. But that again is another story. Fire carriages and iron wheels would carry the dead. Well, in 1937, there was another tragedy in Scotland. This time, young workers uh, died in a fire in a dormitory in Kirkintullo. And 10 young victims aged from 13 to 23 perished in the fire. And they were brought home. On the 17th of September 1937, one of those locomotives brought two parcel vans converted into hearses out to Acco with the dead. It stopped at Newport. One man in Newport uh, was found, uh, the, the parish priest in Newport said that they came the rosary on the platform as the station, as the train stopped for people to pay their respects. Um, there was one man noted in floods of tears. He had lost both his sons in the tragedy. The train went on its melancholy way. I was in the fortunate position to interview the fireman of it uh, about 30 years ago. He was in his 80s then. And he said, I left something behind on that train. I said, what do you mean? <coughs> well, he said, as we're coming into Mulrani, he said, I noticed the smell of sea air. And he leans over the side of the cab, and the wind lifts his cap. Uh, this is my cap uh, stood there. So. <coughs> anyway, the train got into action. By this stage, with only two trains a day, the Great Southern was running the railway down. They didn't keep much coal in Achill anymore because they coaled the locomotive in Westport and it was enough to get it out and back. So they, he, he remembered scratching about in the coal bunker trying to get enough to top it up because he had to take the empty engine back to Athlone. By this stage, um, the railway had only two weeks to go. Thirteen days later, now the, 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 the folklore says that the first and last trains carried the dead. That's, the first train did, the last train didn't. This happened on the, um, third, what was it, the 17th of September. On the 30th of September, the last trains ran. And it was the same type of engine. The line closed without much fanfare. The following day, one of the locomotives went out empty to bring back the empty trucks. Now, I'll show you a few more pictures. These are some of the carriages. This shows the interior of them. The carriages were 30 feet long. You notice there's no gangway into the next carriage. There's a door either side, bench seating the whole way across, a full partition to the next compartment. You couldn't walk through them. This was a distinctive design of this line on, on the Midland Great Western in general. The windows, the square corners, the bottom, <coughs> round corners, the top, they were identifiable all over Ireland. There's the birdcage break. Some of them had passenger compartments in them for third class, some of them didn't. Some of them would have had another set of double doors here, just for more uh, parcels and stuff. That's one of those. These were built in large numbers in the 1880s and 90s. Now, early, in the early days of the railway, the train consisted of a first-class carriage, one or two thirds, and uh, until 1914, a second class as well, and the brake fell at the end. By the 1930s, the numbers of passengers were smaller, and they had a single coach, a first-class compartment, with the one on the door and just out of sight, a third class compartment, three in the door and the van. That's all the train was. And this suitcase is owned by the photographer, an English insurance agent called Henry Casserly, who travelled all around the railroads of Ireland in the 1930s and again in the 1950s. There's one of the great thirds, little narrow third class compartments. The guard's entrance, 
his lookout, the double doors for parcels, and a third class coach behind. That's a back door. This carriage ended up an old carriage of this type. I took that picture in 1980 in Cork. But a lot of these old carriages were withdrawn in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, they found their way as crew accommodation on breakdown and maintenance trains. And this one ended up in the Cork breakdown train and in 1980 and is, is being preserved. It's under restoration with the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland at Whitehead in County Antrim. DSER, Dublin and South Eastern Railway, Harcourt Street to Wexford. When the railways were all amalgamated, the wagons got mixed up all over the place. That's a Zackham. That's quite a long way from Enniscorthy or Bray. And that's a soft top. You can see a different panel in the middle, but it's had a corrugated iron roof put across the whole lot of it to make it a hard top. It was originally a soft top. And there's one of the old convertibles. Great Southern and Western Railway, GSWR. That's Dublin to Cork, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, Kerry. So all of those wagons pictured with Ackham, they're all well away from home. Train in Westport. We're now going to take a run along the line through the eyes of Henry Casterly, the uh, photographer. Between, he went out to Ackham on the 17th of July, 1934, when there were still three trains a day, and he came back the following day. He took this picture in Ackham, first of all. The carriage shed is gone, but the carriage sidings are still there. There's the wagons waiting to be added to the train. The railway turntable is down here. That's to connect the locomotive shed out to the main line, which is here. There's the locomotive on the turntable. You're looking off up through the cutting towards Mulrenny. He's coming off the turntable now, and he's going to get, he's getting a drink of water from the water tower, which is still standing. He was a new recruit from Westport. He was a locomotive cleaner. The train, the wagons are over there. Behind the chimney is the carriage sitting at the platform. Now he sets off. He, he comes into Monorani. He's looking out of the carriage. He's looking back towards the Ben Mullet Road Bridge. He's looking back towards Ackham. So Ackham Station building is the other side of the train. This is the toward the loop, the one that has the water tower at the end of it. It's had this big sign, it's had this little shelter, and a gravel surface, and the barrel crossing in lieu of a footbridge. There's the train, he's shunting. That's the line for the platform but he's pushed the carriage over to hitch the trucks up to the back of us. All this palaver that went on. And there's the train ready to go. The locomotive, the one carriage, the van, and the goods wagons. You can see, if you look closely at the original one of those pictures, the track's covered in weeds. And you also can see the paint is peeling off that, off the signal cabin. The, it hasn't, it's definitely arrears of maintenance. Now he's in Mulrenny. He's got out of the thing, and now the locomotive, he is giving it a drink here. Maybe he didn't get enough water in uh, Ackle, I don't know. That was unusual. He stopped the train as he enters the platform. That's what you'd water it with going the other way. That's why the water thing is at that end, because the carriage is parked away down there. People will be going to open the door and say, oh, where's the platform? What's up there? Do you see what I mean? He gets into Newport. He's facing the viaduct. That's the little building. It had an awning then. This is where the apartments are now. He's gone into the loop so that the Westport to Ackle train can come in here past him. But before that happens, he's something to do. He unhooks. He's unhooked. Where's the engine gone? Well, he's come up here. He's crossed over to that track. He's gone down the back and he's lifting a wagon off the end of the train. There he's lifted it off. There's the van at the end. There's the engine. He's taken the wagon off the back and he's going to shove it in here now between that wall and what is now the oratory. You can see the big sliding doors because it was the goods shed and there's the road bridge there. 
a footbridge in the station is long gone. And now the train's coming in off the viaduct, the Dublin train is coming in, one carriage again, and a few trucks, same type of engine. This is a picture taken at Monorani. Uh, it's the only known picture showing, that's the station, showing it from the Newport side, showing good siding. And this is where a wagon ran away, and they therefore had to introduce this rule about pinning the brakes down in the wagons. Now this is the very last day. Remember this is two weeks after the coffin train. The railway went on after, operating after that. This picture was taken by the late Joe Sweeney of Ackland Sound. And this is Mr. Considine, the station master of Ackland. And the locomotive, number 530, has come down the day after the railway closed to lift whatever empty trucks there were still lying around. So it's a ghost train in a way. He's got a bit of coal, he's raked out the clinkers, you'd always see the clinkers here on the track in front of the local shed. He'd give the locomotive a final drink of water, he'd hit, hook up to the trucks and off he goes. The second locomotive road has no track, they've already lifted that to keep the bus in. And there's the crew ready to go. The late Huey Dawson, his grandson, is still on the railway to this day in England. And the day of the book launch of the book, over 20 years ago now, there was a man approached me when I was signing books at the end, and he says, my dad's, oh no, he says, my grandfather is in your book. And I looked at this man, and I thought, I know, I know damn rightly who you are. He was the living image of this guy. I knew straight away. I said, are you a Dawson? He says, yep. So there you go. This fella, um, I can't remember his name, he's the young fella, he's a trainee. He's, he's passed out as a locomotive cleaner. But how he progressed to the next level, nowadays there'd be official training courses, and you do step one and step two and step three. But the way you did it in those days, right, you're okay, you can light an engine, come along on the 5.30, and I'll show you how to fire. Now you have a go. And once I think you're okay at it, then I recommend to my boss that you're passed out as a fireman. So that would have been his next stage. And here is the last train of empty wagons getting ready to leave. The station master shaking hands with the driver for the very last time. 1st of October 1937. And there it is. Just empty trucks. There's nobody about. It's too late. You missed the last train. That was yesterday. There's a train in Westport. Nowadays, trains leave all leave from the far platform from this line. But you notice if you're in Westport Station, there's another platform opposite. That's this one. That's where the Ackham trains used to live. We know that that is an Ackham train about to leave, rather than a Dublin train arrived because of the locomotive. It's one of the five Ackham locomotives. There it is again, another Cassidy photograph. Mm -hmm. This isn't a Cassidy photograph, it shows a train coming into Mulrani. You have the main running line, you have the loop, the platforms are to the left. It's approaching the station from the Newport side. These are the two freight sidings. The freight shed is just out of sight to the right. This is leaving Mulrani again in later days, just one carriage and one van and the freight trucks at the back. I like that one. It's one of the very few views of the line as the train started going along in the countryside. And here with the train coming from Ackham on a rainy day in Mulrani. Mulrani was the least busy station. Uh, had the line survived, they would probably have closed Mulrani station and the train would have only stopped at Newport and then gone, round, gone on to Ackham. Uh, it was uh, the number of daily passengers and the tonnage of freight was it's a faded practical relevance at this stage. There appears to be nobody getting on or off the train. It's pouring rain. It's the, the locomotive is parked outside the water tower, but an engine that size has enough water to get it to Athlone. So you can see there's no water being piped in. By this stage, that thing is useless. But there is the water column on this side for trains going down to Ackham, which is so early. Now, this is an interesting one. This appeared in Pigler's book. And um, 
It's a picture of a religious procession, apparently around June time in Newport. So what's this? Well, this is two things. It's got a number of points of interest. Firstly, it's the only known photograph of a train on that viaduct. Secondly, remember the flyaway cab, as they called it, that they later rebuilt. Very few engines retained those after about 1925, 26. Now, a few did, a few did, so the picture might be later than that. But given the locomotive alone, the chances are it's earlier than that. The carriages, two third class carriages, a main line bogey coach with first and third, and another third class brake at the end, a seating capacity of 300 and no trucks. What's going on there? That is not the 8.35, or sorry, the 11.40 from Mackerel to Westport, which would have had one carriage containing maybe 10 people or four and a few trucks. So what's a passenger train that size doing the Ackerl line? That's almost certainly a harvester special. Long before the line was built, throughout its life, and long after it closed, there was this seasonal emigration which was responsible for the drowning tragedy in 1895 and the fire tragedy in 1937. This is almost certainly a harvester's train out of Acre. Some of them did run as late as June, though they were mostly, uh, it was mostly sort of Easter to May time that they went. But some of them did go later on. That's almost certainly what that is. Now, a few other bits. Before the railway was built, this is round Burshul Bridge. Now the railway comes along like this. So this is what happened. Entrance to a state, the owner of which picked up a fuss about the railway crossing his land. There's the railway added in. So the road is now being diverted. That was the original road there. It's now being diverted like that, and that little bridge is still there under the greenway. Now what for the railway closed? When the railway closed, we diverted the railway across here. And the bridge that there is there now, the base of it is the old railway bridge. And there's is nowadays the old Barshield Bridge. And as it is now, you can see the stone of the old railway bridge down there. That is the graveyard in Ackle Island for the 32 victims of the drowning tragedy. And that is the bus that replaced the train. Newport Station as it is today, Mulroney Water Tank as it is today, Westport Station as it is today, the freight yard is our car park, so the actual train would have gone from here on out. And the little shelter where you waited for the train to Ackle. Pre Greenway, <laughs> my sister is Mrs. Catherine Martin. Uh, she was married 10 years when I put that picture of hers in the book and credited it to Catherine Beaumont, and her hubby says to me, what about me? <laughs> so that was the mistake in the actual book. There's where it went over, the um, road in Westport. One of the standard old railway gates is still there. This is where the fish siding was at Tom McGee. That's, you probably recognize that, that's long gone. That's a gatekeeper's cottage. That's just about it. There's a railway coming into Mulroney, and that is a director's special in 1905 because that is one of two brand new first class carriages, only weeks old. The roof is still white. Carriage roofs did not stay white very long when they were hauled by steam engines. So, thank you for that. <laughs>